already. Uh, I assume you can uh, all hear me alright. So, first, uh, I would like to tell you a story. So, ever since ancient times, uh, people have made observations uh, about the nature that surrounds us. And they noticed that, for example, dough could be turned into bread, and clay could be turned into bricks, and wood into charcoal, and fat into soap, and grain into beer, and so on. And so they had this natural question that can we do it with anything? For example, can we turn iron into gold? And so thousands of alchemists uh, spent many centuries trying to solve this problem. Uh, but they, since they did not really have uh, a very clear understanding of how different substances actually uh, work, what's inside them, how they, how they behave, so their approach could not be uh, very systematic or scientific. Uh, so, for example, yeah, they uh, had this idea that uh, when you take sulfur and mercury and mix them in the correct ratio, then you can get any other substance. And so they poured sulfur from one jar and mercury from another, and then said magic words to it, habada, 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 and boiled and filtered and heated and condensed. Uh, but of course, uh, one, uh, in addition to uh, doing experiments, people need to eat. So oftentimes they uh, offer their services to various kings and princes and uh, just to get funding for their experiments. And the kings were greedy. And the alchemists oftentimes made a promise that, hey, they can actually solve this problem of uh, turning non-precious metals into gold. And, uh, yeah, it, uh, it worked for a while, but then, then the king started to ask for concrete results. And, and then the alchemists were in trouble. And sometimes uh, they actually uh, tried some forgery. Uh, for example... Uh, they could take gold bars and cover them with tin, and then you would heat uh, the gold bars, and the tin would melt, and gold would become uh, visible, and they could say, hey, I turned tin into gold. Uh, of course, uh, sometimes they also got caught. And in these cases, the punishment was severe. Uh, it, was, it was usual uh, to punish failed alchemists uh, the same way how money forgers were punished. And in medieval times, a common punishment for money forgery was pouring molten tin down your throat, which is very, very unpleasant. So, time passed. Uh, so, mathematics has had a pretty solid foundation since ancient times. And during Renaissance, Galilei did his experiments and physics uh, became a proper science. And then uh, came Robert Boyle and Lavoisier and Lomonosov and Mendeleev, and the era of alchemists was over. And similarly, uh, different sciences have gone through this maturing process, where before we do things in a very ad hoc manner, and afterwards we actually know what we are doing. So what about IT? Uh, IT is currently uh, in this sort of, kind of, early scientific stage. Uh, and mostly managers of software projects, most of them perform a lot of alchemy in their projects. So uh, usually everybody knows that yeah, making software requires money, and the programmers like caffeinated drinks so the project managers uh, take a bunch of money and then they take a bunch of caffeine and try to mix them and then they go to the customer and say hubbada 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 to the customer. <laughs> Alright? So, uh, and just like alchemists, when they don't have a real understanding of uh, what the issues are, how the te uh, technology works, then the results are not uh, any more successful either. So sometimes they do achieve success, 
through trial and error. Sometimes they don't. And, and sometimes they go and bluff to the customer. And when the customer finds out about it, then we can be very grateful that we are not living in medieval times because the customer is every bit as angry as the medieval kings. But fortunately for us, uh, it is illegal to execute people with molten tin these days. So that being said, uh, I will go through my will transform uh, from alchemist uh, to modern day office worker. Uh, give me a second here. All right, you can still hear me? I hope. So, yeah, in real life, my name is Targo. Uh, I have been making software for uh, about 20 years. Uh, seen lots of failure, gone through lots of trial and error. Uh, so in the agenda today, uh, we talked a bit about alchemists and managers. Uh, we will uh, also talk about uh, infinite numbers of turtles. Uh, we will talk about blue whales in Shanghai. Uh, we will talk about wooden airplanes. Uh, and if we have any time, we will talk about how the world will end. And, and maybe at the end we will have some time, uh, to see, hey, how to, how to get out of this mess. Anyway, so let's, so the, so the first reason sort of allegorically we covered. So the first reason software has bugs is that people don't really know what they're doing, which is a very fundamental reason. But let's talk about the world. So let's say if I, uh, on my computer, if I went to a uh, Google homepage, what happens? Uh, a bunch of scripts get executed, a bunch of technologies, and the claim, my claim is, that no one understands what actually happens. No one understands it fully. So maybe you don't believe me. Let's, let's try to simplify. So just my computer connects to www.google.com. What happens? A bunch of technologies, mostly related to the network stack, get executed. Uh, and again, my claim is that no individual or a single company fully comprehends what uh, is going on. Well, let's, let's try to simplify. Uh, I just type the web address on the browser's address bar. Nothing else. So again, a thousand different, uh, wheels will turn, uh, to actually, uh, translate my key presses into something that the silicon bits inside my computer uh, would understand. Well, and again, the claim is that still no single individual or company understands this whole complexity. Uh, let's, let's simplify more. I just press, press a key, press any key on my keyboard. Thousands of different things happen because inside every keyboard there is a microchip and which executes thousands of different things when I press that key. And, well, now maybe you start believing me that, hey, no one really, really understands the whole complexity of this process. So before we, now, let me, uh, uh, let me tell you another story before we come back to, uh, to the complexity. So a well-known scientist, and some people say it was Bertrand Russell, uh, once gave a public lecture about astronomy. So he described how the Earth orbits around the Sun and how the Sun in turn orbits the center of the galaxy. And at the end of the lecture, a little old lady came to Bertrand Russell and said, all this stuff you told us, that's rubbish. That really, the Earth is a flat disk which lies on top of four elephants and the elephants stand on top of a turtle. And the scientist asked, well, what does the turtle stand on? And the old lady said, well, it stands on another turtle. And, well, what does the other turtle stand on? 
And then the little old lady replied, Well, you are a very clever young man, but it's really turtles all the way down. <laughs> so, and this is really where we are with our software. Uh, we cannot simplify any further, because to understand the microchip, we need software. So it's machines making machines. And we have actually gone through this loop uh, lots and lots of times already. So, and it really is turtles all the way down. And life is literally mad uh, when we talk about software. So for any software to function, uh, you have to have those millions of gears rotating in precise uh, synchronous manner and if anything gets stuck, well, then things don't work. And, um, yeah, it does make one wonder or, or like appreciate it like anything in uh, technology ever works at all. So, so this was another angle uh, at the at the issue of like uh, what we are really up against. Uh, so next up, uh, let's let's do, do a quiz. Uh, I'm gonna need I'm gonna need that uh, this thing here. I try to bring it to somewhere where as many people as possible can actually see it. Uh, set it somewhere here. Anyway, uh, so the rules are simple. Uh, for every question, uh, give two numbers. Uh, what do you think uh, the lower and upper limit would be so that you are kind of sure that the right answer uh, is uh, between those two numbers? And put away your phones and stuff. No, no looking up stuff uh, with your phones, because that's cheating. We're not cheaters. We're professionals. <laughs> anyway, so question number one. What is the surface temperature of the sun? 6,000. 6, All right. Uh, is that upper or lower limit? Lower. Hmm? Lower. Lower. OK. 6,000 to, what's the upper? Eight. To 8,000. I'm afraid you might have peeked into my slides. Maybe you did. Anyway, uh, let, me, let, me, let me try to find someone who definitely has not seen my slides before. So, what is the latitude of Shanghai, Lydia? Give me a number. <laughs> Between zero and a thousand. All right. Uh, next question. What is the area of Asia? Uh, guy with the beard. Richard. Uh, square kilometers for instance, or whatever you like. 4.2 million. No, million. Uh, is that upper or lower? Upper and lower? 1 to 4.2 million squ square kilometers. All right. Uh, next up. Uh, in what year was Alexander the Great born? Uh, answers, you over there, your name is Madis. Between 100 and 400. All right. Uh, next, um, uh, how many euros? in cash or in circulation. And we're talking about value. Uh, so a lady with this striped shirt. Uh, yeah, like how, how, how much cash? 
how much euro cash is there? I'm sorry? Uh, no, it is countable. It is actually known. <laughs> well, give me a number. You want to help out? 250 million. And the other limit? Well, give me, give me, give, give me a number. I'm sorry. 100 million to 250 million. All right. Next question. Uh, what is the volume of the Baltic Sea? Uh, Thousand square kilometers. Cubic kilometers. We have a three dimensional C. <laughs> All right. So one hundred to two hundred and fifty thousand cubic kilometers. Uh, let me turn to the other side a little bit. How much money did the movie Titanic make in theaters? You. Between 200 and 1 billion. All right. Yeah, I should I should try to do something about the screen, but two hundred million to one billion dollars. Okay, we are almost to the end. A few more questions. Uh, how long is the coastline of Pacific Ocean? Uh, you. Hey. Between 10 and 25,000, 10k to 25k kilometers. How many books, and we're talking about different titles, have been published uh, in the history of the United States? So, you. Between 100,000 and a million. All right. And last question. What is the weight of the heaviest blue whale? Uh, answer, Pavel. Five to 10 tons. All right. So these were all the questions. Let's see how we did. So uh, we, by the way, uh, as I said, uh, we should have given answers in, in a way that we're like 90% sure uh, that the correct answer is uh, in between uh, those two numbers. So we should have approximately nine correct answers here. OK, what is the surface temperature of the sun? I forgot that hey I had actually sent you the slide so so you cheated <laughs> but all right we will we will we will get a point Second the latitude of Shanghai uh is at 31 degrees uh north Yeah we got you right <laughs> Uh the area of Asia is about 44 million uh, square kilometers uh the so Alexander the Great was born three, uh, 356 BC. So we did not get that. Uh, and uh, there is almost a trillion euros in cash 
It might be more now, like people keep printing money. That's the last time when I looked it up on the European Central Bank website. Uh, number six, uh, the volume of the Baltic Sea is about 21,000 cubic kilometers. Uh, the movie Titanic made almost two billion uh, dollars uh, in theaters. Uh, the coastline of Pacific Ocean, about 135,000 uh, kilometers. Uh, there have been about 22 bi uh, million books have been published in the United States. And the, and the weight of the heaviest blue whale uh, has been 170 tons. So we got two right uh, out of ten. Uh, one of them uh, semi-cheated. <laughs> so anyway, uh, what was the point? So obviously, the point was not to find out, hey, what you know about the sun and whales and uh, and so on. The point uh, was that this is how the process of software project estimation works. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. So the way it usually works is that the project manager goes to a program and asks, hey, how long will this take? So the honest answer would be, I have no freaking idea. Because, well, software, unfortunately, it's, it's, it's not like building a house. Once you build a house, you know how, how long it took, you can build another one just like that. With software, if, if I had actually done the exact same thing before, I would not have to build it again. I would just take the existing one and copy it in place and it would take me one minute. So, so the honest answer should be, I have no idea. But unfortunately, uh, and especially the more experienced, uh, the specialist is, the, the more senior the programmer is, the more embarrassed he or she will be to say that, hey, I have no idea. Because, well, they, they got hired, uh, and they are getting paid, paid good money to know this kind of stuff. So they will give some, uh, random number, uh, or, uh, uh, the second best answer might actually be, uh, the type of answer that we got to question number two, between like zero and infinity, essentially. So you can say, yeah, it might take me an hour, it might take me a month. So. <laughs> which sometimes that is the level of unknown uh, that exists there. But then the project manager will get upset and say, no, 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 give me, give me a better answer than that. And so they, the programmer gets pressured into uh, giving, a, uh, giving a slightly more precise answer. And so the project manager takes all those numbers, all those 10 numbers, and adds them up as like square kilometers to tons and, uh, <laughs> and, and so on. And, and then they come up with, uh, with some kind of a schedule, which could be off like tenfold one way or another way. No one knows. Unfortunately, there is this thing called the Hofstadter's law, which states that it always takes longer than, ex than you expect. That's the first part of Hofstadter's law. The second part is that it always takes longer than you expect, even when you take into account Hofstadter's law, <laughs> which is true. <laughs> Because again, like when we when we think that hey we have some time we will fill it with something else and then in the end we are we're always late. And obviously, when people have promised to to deliver something on time with some features, well, what do you think will be cut first? Quality. So that's uh, that's another uh, big huge reason why uh, software has bugs. Because like in my experience, like maybe 2% of all software is delivered in a non-hurried fashion when you actually have enough time to, to get everything done. Oh, well. I'm sorry? Uh, probably, because of the other reasons. So we're screwed <laughs> anyway. Although it might have less. It's so, so, so it's a, it's a matter of like how how bad the situation is. It's very seldom is the situation really, really good. Usually it's like a choice between bad and horrible. Anyway, so then uh, one thing 
that is a really, really unfortunate thing about the software industry. Much of today's software uh, is delivered as part of like large efforts, large uh, projects. And by large, here I mean like one manier or more. So if it's like uh, four programmers working on on a uh, on some scope for three months, okay, that uh, also uh, counts as large. And uh, within these large projects, uh, half. Uh, of all the features which were in the original scope will never be used because uh, at the start of the uh, of the project we had like some guess like what we might want but we didn't really know and the really tragic thing is that sometimes the development hasn't even started and we already know that hey these things in this contract that we promised to deliver they were kind of pointless. There, there was some misunderstanding and we don't really need these. But hey, the contract has been signed. And especially if you are in like public sector, then uh, you have your budget. You have to spend it on something. Otherwise, you are in big trouble. And, and then uh, many people uh, in our industry work on stuff that is, uh, that is never going to be used. And they know that. And that's, that's rather demoralizing. Anyway. Uh, let's go to something seemingly uh, jollier. Agile development. Let me just ask a question. Uh, how many of you uh, work on an agile project? Yay, most. All right. Uh, so before before we discuss that further, uh, let's uh, uh, remind ourselves what is an Agile project. So the Agile, um, Agile software development, uh, it started with the Agile Manifesto, which is like almost 20 years old by now. Uh, so, and it started when uh, a bunch of smart guys uh, who had been working on large projects, they felt that, hey, they are way too bureaucratic and uh, there's like way too much uh, documentation and like every change takes too long, uh, too much time, and so on. So they, so they put together this thing called the, the Agile Manifesto. You can read the, read it at uh, agilemanifesto.org. And and they were successful. Uh, they practiced these principles, and they did produce some really good software. So now let's step aside. Uh, to another story. So this story goes back to 1940s, uh, the time of World War II uh, in the Pacific. Uh, and there were there are lots of uh, small islands in the Pacific Ocean, and uh, many of those were occupied by the uh, United States Army uh, during uh, the war. And for the locals, it was it was kind of an amazing thing that these guys came down from sky with airplanes, and they had like all this cool stuff with them, like from chewing gum to automatic weapons, and magic. And and and, and the and the U.S. Army shared some of that uh, some some of these goodies with the locals, and the locals thought, hey, that was really cool. But then the war ended. The army left, the airplanes took off, and and the locals started thinking, "Hey, how can we how can we get all, the, all this good stuff back?" So on many of those islands, uh, they built uh, wooden runways and uh, mock uh, wooden airplanes, and they built like a hut and put some guy to sit in there, and and he had like. Uh, Head, uh, earphones made of coconut shells and some bamboo sticks <laughs> sticking out of those headphones. And, and then they started waiting for the planes to come back. So, obviously the, the airplanes did not come. <laughs> and wh what was, what was the issue? Uh, again, uh, the, uh, poor inhabitants of, of these islands, well, they went through the motions, but but since they did not really really understand why 
uh, the army was building the runway or, or like why they had this guy sitting somewhere with antennas and, 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 and headphones. Well, then obviously it could not work. So it's kind of the same unfortunate thing with agile development uh, today. So many things, uh, many people uh, did follow the agile principles and were successful. Even more people uh, saw that and wanted to emulate that success. But they focused on kind of the wrong things. So for example, they, they noticed that yeah, some agile companies, they were doing uh, like daily status meetings when they shared information with each other. And that's how, yeah, the daily stand-up uh, was born. And a bunch of consultants uh, started making lots of money uh, by telling other software companies that, hey, in order to be su successful, you have to have a daily meeting. So with that, let's talk about what is not agile development. So you can have daily stand-ups. But if you're not changing your plans based on them, then you are not really agile. Sorry. If you call your iteration sprints, but if you're not deploying each and every sprint to the end user, then you are not agile. If you call your to-do list a backlog, but at the same time, you are stuck in a contract which has like fixed scope and fixed price and fixed deadline, then by, by the very definition, you are not agile. Because, well, agility is about uh, being able to react to change. So this is uh, really uh, a topic for a whole another talk. But the, uh, but the point is that many uh, software organizations today they they follow this thing called the half-assed agile software development, <laughs> and there is actually uh, there is a website for this as well. It it is called the half-assed uh, agile manifesto dot org, <laughs> or or something like that. You can look it up. So and yeah, we can read through that, and and this is unfortunately it's it's, it's more common in in public sector and public sector projects. And, and in companies that service, uh, the public sector. So, yeah, uh, you have all those rules, but then you have the but. Yeah, you can, you can play, you can, uh, uh, do all your daily stand-ups and you can do all that, but you cannot really change anything. You cannot change the scope. You cannot change the deadline. You cannot get more budget. And, and so, so it's just as good as the wooden airplane. All right. Uh, let's. I'll, I'll tell. I'll, I, I will tell you another story. <laughs> this is a story about seven monkeys. So, uh, in some zoo, uh, there were seven monkeys in a cage, and then the zookeepers did this experiment. They uh, put a bunch of bananas uh, to the ceiling of the room and the step ladder. Uh, underneath that. And yeah, uh, first monkey uh, saw the bananas, tried to climb up the step ladder, but the ladder uh, was connected uh, with a mechanism which, uh, like whenever you stepped on it, uh, it sprayed ice cold water all over the cage. So the monkeys learned really quick. Okay, no touching the bananas. And then came the next part of the experiment. Uh, one monkey was taken out of, of the cage, was replaced with another monkey. The new monkey came in, uh, saw the bananas, tried to go after the bananas. The other uh, monkeys pulled him back from the ladder and beat him up. All right, the new monkey learned, no touching the bananas. So they replaced another monkey. The new monkey tried to do the same thing. Again, the others beat him up. But what was noticeable was that the most aggressive uh, monkey towards the newcomer was the previous newcomer. All right. Uh, and, and so they replaced all the monkeys. So until there were no monkeys left who actually remembered the original, uh, cold water thing, 
And and the cold water had actually been turned off already. But still, all the monkeys knew that, hey, you shall not step on the ladder. You shall not uh, go take the bananas. So this is this is how organizational cultures work. <laughs> and and there are actually, uh, yeah, in like pretty much each and every team I have uh, I have been a part of. There are some there are some bits and pieces of the seven monkey uh, seven, seven monkey syndrome that we do some things, but we don't really really know why we are doing them. So we just go through some kinds of some uh, some kind of motions, and uh, this brings me uh, to the quote of the best project management handbook, uh, which is called Winnie the Pooh. So Winnie the Pooh is the best book about software project management. But anyway, the uh, the quote was about Christopher Robin uh, going up the stairs and dragging Winnie the Pooh. Uh, his original name, by the way, was Edward. Uh, so, and he was dragging Winnie the Pooh uh, upstairs behind him, and 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 the teddy bear's head went like boom, boom, boom against the stairs. And yeah, he and 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 there was like some feeling that hey, we could do things better, but yeah, if only if only we could stop for a moment and and think about it. But instead, we just keep kept going like boom, boom, boom against the stairs. And this is, at least to my feeling, uh, a pretty good metaphor for like how uh, software projects uh, are executed on a daily basis. We go from like one fire to another and like one hot fix to another and one emergency to another. And we don't really, really have time to like take a step back and say, hey, maybe, maybe uh, we are like standing on our heads. So, and and in the in, in terms of the big picture, this is another reason why software has bugs in the end, because we never have time to think about hey how to how to do things properly. All right, so there is a temptation to say that hey let's just test things more, let's test them more carefully, uh, let's break the system into small pieces and test each each and one every small piece, and then the, uh, life will be good. Well, many of you have probably seen this picture. If you haven't, you have seen it now. So this is another thing that happens uh, thousands of times every day in the magical world of software. So uh, all the little pieces they get tested. We put it all together and nothing works. So, uh, so this is this is the note about uh, about testing each and every uh, small piece. All right. So now we might we might think that hey, uh, it's it's kind of all right. Well, we will we will get through it somehow. Uh, maybe maybe not. Now it's getting a little more philosophical. Let's talk about this thing called the singularity. Uh, singularity, uh, the definition is this explosion of machine intelligence uh, when uh, at some point, let's see the day, second point, uh, when at some point the machines become smarter than people. And then they will be able to either improve themselves or build even better machines. And so on and so forth, and two days will pass, and then the machines will tell humans either, hey, do we put you in some reservation, or do we kill you off uh, altogether, or will you be our pets, or, or or something like that. So, and when I when I read about this topic, uh, then uh, lots of people say that, hey, we can. Do not worry, we can control this. Yeah, let's like, like we put all our self-learning artificial intelligences uh, into an offline computer, which is in a closed room, and it will not be connected to the internet ever or anything or, or something like that. And and when I read these opinions, then I think about the infinite monkeys, and the fact that hey, we don't we don't even understand today's software, so how could we ever understand a self-learning artificial intelligence? And 
it seems it seems to me really misguided to to think that hey we would be able to control it it's it's kind of like because the uh the intelligence uh of a post singularity artificial intelligence well compared to human intelligence it's just like human intelligence compared to let's say a spider's intelligence and and now imagine if if a bunch of spiders they somehow catch a human and they say hey we will uh keep this human uh our prisoner by not giving him any spider silk to make a web and 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 catch food it's kind of silly right so similarly uh we would not be able to contain uh a hyper intelligent artificial intelligence because uh they could i don't know rearrange the atoms in 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 the memory of uh, of the computer in which it resides and build some kind of quantum tunnel to to the next room or 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 something like that we have no idea it it will discover some uh unknown physical uh principle for that so anyway uh the summary so far uh people who work on software don't know what they're doing uh people who work on software don't understand what it is they are working on uh the estimates don't work the procedures don't work testing doesn't work and the and the machines are taking over so time to panic <laughs> so i wish i was i i wish i could say in the last two slides and i i that hey it's all right unfortunately it's not so uh there are some uh there are some ways how not to fix the problems which again i have i have seen people doing like all over and over but it's but it's again just like winnie the pooh hitting uh his head against the staircase so adding more people never ever works if you have a project which is in trouble you add more people it will be in even more trouble it's kind of pretty much like a law of nature so much better to create multiple smaller projects instead uh then there is this very tempting uh solution that hey let's write down all the requirements and the developers shall d- uh do stuff exactly to the spec and and so on well yeah you you might be able to do that you get this mega waterfall and whenever anything changes you start over and and then whenever the first real user sees it then you have to start all over and maybe in like 20 years uh you will finish something but by then uh all the original uh users are like dead or retired or whatever so that doesn't work either uh then there are uh this is really popular with the developers hey if only we use this magical technology or we use this framework or uh, or this other programming language then things would be much better no uh this is not the case so the reasons for failures are very seldom technical it is mostly about communication it's mostly about understanding uh the requirements it's about understanding the technology and if you replace it with something else okay you still have to understand that uh it's not just magically better so so this doesn't work either so a few things which do work a little bit um well first for the 50% rule uh this is something like especially if you are involved in the public sector uh the solution to the 50% rule is that whenever you have some budget for a software project never ever spend it all on the original scope take half of your budget make a scope do the procurement process uh get someone to to develop it once you have spent all of that then you will hopefully know what it was that you really really wanted and and then spend the the other half getting what you really wanted so if if you will remember like one thing from my presentation then try to remember this and and if you're not involved yourself uh in this like if you're not a project manager and you're not actually in charge of the budget then it is actually the professional duty uh of the technical people to educate 
uh, the customer about it. And if you are uh, if you're on the development side, then again, you have to tell it uh, to your customers. So it should be part of the uh, software development ethics to uh, to do this. Uh, a few more things, what to do. Uh, so first, uh, there is no silver bullet. Uh, there are there are always risks. The software, it is insanely complicated. So there are always things that can go wrong. The only thing you can really, really do about it is prepare for common things which can go wrong and try to try to preempt them. Because the earlier you catch them, uh, the lesser the cost will be. If you find the problem uh, when you have already invested uh, lots of time and money, well, then you have to redo more stuff. There are some checklists. I have uh, one uh, checklist on my own website. Uh, you can uh, you can Google for it if you'd like. Uh, I did not invent that particular checklist. I uh, I got it from a uh, a book by Steve McConnell. Uh, but but this is the but since it was on on, on uh, just on paper, uh, I uh, I made it digital. So you can go there and just. Fill in a bunch of uh, check marks uh, and think about your current software project. And it should give you an estimate of whether your current software project is likely to succeed or fail. So maybe it will it will help you uh, think about that. Then uh, when we talk about agility or like any other, so I love agile software development. But the important thing to remember is that agility uh, is not a method. There is no there is no such thing as like a checklist. That, hey, your meetings have to be in this format, and your iterations have to have like this length, and and you have to use this project management technology uh, or project management tool uh, to to organize your tasks. No, it's not that. It's about uh, it's about the mindset. It's about thinking, uh, thinking about the original manifesto, and and thinking how can you uh, organize the process so that you can actually react to change uh, as needed. And last but not least, uh, it's about understanding what it is you really do. Uh, what is inside the components out of which we uh, we build the software? What what is inside the tools that we use for it? And why do we do it? Like, do we do we have a reason why why we do things in a certain way, or are we in the cage of seven monkeys? Although the monkeys might be wearing like a white shirt and and, and tie. So, so that's it. Uh, I hope I did not scare you completely, or if I did, then maybe maybe you can go back and. And think about how to uh, how to make the world a little bit less scary place. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dargo. Actually, you're scared, at least for me, because you are not the first during this conference, but already second, who actually said that Terminators will come. Just question is <laughs> when. Uh, uh, I think there is a 50-50 chance that it will occur in our lifetimes. <laughs> so, uh, I want to see some hands for questions. Really? Everybody scared? <laughs> or tired? Oh, thank you. I have a short question not connected with your talk. Uh, why Bandora? Uh... <laughs> You mean like why Bondora for myself, or okay? Uh, there are okay. Now this this sounds very much like advertising, but since you asked, uh, I like the culture. I think it's a super fun company. Uh, I very much like the management. Uh, I have huge intellectual respect uh, for Bertel Domberg, and. 
uh, I like the fact uh, that we are uh, a fast-moving uh, experimental company, and I get to do really fun stuff every day. So <laughs> I don't know if, if 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 that was what you were going after. <laughs> Should I, should I buy bu bunker or seriously how how do you think uh, people should prepare for machines take over or what should they do <laughs> to avoid this I'm not sure if if you can really do anything about it it's it is getting into sort of religious uh realm uh in a sense that uh if this intelligence explosion were to take place, then our understanding of that is kind of like a spider's understanding of why humans do some things. So I, I, I would say I, I would just take some uh, uh, philosophical approach. That, hey, if it happens, it happens. You cannot do anything about it. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Then live life as uh, as you do. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, but it's kind of unknowable how much time we have. I thought we had more time, but uh, the news at the start of this year, uh, like earlier this year, about AlphaGo, uh, the uh, the artificial intelligence which uh, beat uh, the best humans in the board game of Go, uh, that. Uh, that actually made me really serious about it because the learning process of that artificial intelligence was very, very human-like. And if a computer can learn that, they can really learn like pretty much anything that uh, that people do. Well, you make me think and especially with your last remark, because uh, a game of Go has mm -hmm. a, a definite amount of next steps you can do. Building a computer that's better than the other one, it's a billion times more complex. So I, I don't think I believe in, in, in this thing you call that computers will outrun us. So I won't you might be build right. a bunker. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't have... Uh scientific proof uh for uh for this so it's very it's, it's very much speculative but it's speculative either way and there is a lot of speculation on that topic when you when you, uh, when you read the articles uh about it so you might be right uh somebody uh there might be there might be a third opinion which is uh, which is right we uh we don't really know and a second question. Mm -hmm. You came up with a 40% or 50% rule. Yep. Where did it come from? Uh, experience. So, again, uh, there, is, there is kind of a division line. Uh, like when you... Uh, the more uh, of the scope you define uh, before development starts, uh, the more likely it is that uh, you are not understanding the, comp uh, the problem fully or, or you're like overthinking it in, uh, in the wrong direction and, and then whatever you build uh, it will end up uh, being wasted and yeah I have, I have actually seen that in, in very different organizations uh, and, and with very different cu uh, customers but if you, if, you, if you do like if you do things in, in smaller steps then uh, then you are much more likely to achieve something useful. Uh, it, it probably depends on where you <laughs> where you draw the line. So and I, I think it aligns pretty nicely uh, because when you when, when you build the uh, the minimum viable product, well then it by definition it should be minimal 
uh, that everything inside that product should be absolutely necessary. So, uh, so in this way, uh, you ought to be able to avoid uh, building something that will never be used. Yeah. So, oh. Yeah. Uh, but but then again, uh, when you are building uh, the minimum viable product, uh, then uh, you usually you don't spend uh, all that much time uh, building it. You get to, uh, like most lean startups, they have a few guys who spend uh, it's it's like a matter of weeks, uh, not even months. It's, it's it's like a few guys for uh, for a matter of weeks, and they they build the first prototype and see that hey, is this useful? And then they uh, build on top of that. Uh, well, the 50% rule only applies if you take on a scope which is larger uh, than some threshold. If you stay below that, then uh, then you are wasting less, and then the 50% rule does not apply. Yeah, I have uh, one question and one remark. Uh, I wanted to ask about uh, the monkey experiment. As far as I know, it's an orb urban myth. It hasn't actually never existed. I, oh. I I don't have a citation for it. Yeah, check but it I, out. I, I, I like the story. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's a good story. And the question for you is, um, you came from a background where you did like custom software for your customers, like mm -hmm. not a product, and yep. now you are doing a product, yep. right? Uh, could you kind of like share the experience? What are the differences, like? Mm, maybe quality wise thanks mm -hmm. so i think uh it wasn't uh, the, the the biggest difference uh is not really so much uh in terms of whether you do like custom software uh versus a pro versus product development but it's uh but it's more about how agile uh you are able to be so again, in my previous life, uh, most of the work that we did, we were bound by also by these uh, long-term uh, pr uh, contracts where lots of things were fixed, and we were very much hit by the fifty percent rule, and and that was that did make people uh, rather unhappy. Uh, I have also done product development where our release cycle was like two years and and again uh we probably very much fell uh, fell victim of the 50 percent rule and and then we got isolated uh from the end users uh a lot and and again that made uh that made people unhappy so uh right now uh the things that we do uh, we are able to deploy them every week uh, to to end users, and we do have uh, lots of different uh, metrics uh, how we can uh, measure uh, whether uh, what we did was successful uh, or not. Did it actually improve uh, anything for the customer? Uh, so, so I like that aspect. So. I don't think it's it's really all that much uh, about like what uh, you build and and whether it's whether it's a product or whether it's something for a particular organization, but uh, being in touch with the uh, with the customer and getting like instant feedback uh, that is really cool because well people. Uh, People like this sort of instant gratification, and hey, when you build something and you can ship it and you get uh, feedback about it like two days later, uh, then that's that's kind of nice for many people. Thank you. And now uh, time for the last question. And Yonka in pink shirt wanted to ask one. So about your fifty percent rule. Uh -huh. uh, actually, uh, I really like it, uh, but I wanted to do a quick rain check. Yeah. How many of you actually work in a consultancy that provides software or develops software for 
other companies? Can you raise your hand? So effectively what Targo just told you means that whenever a customer comes to you and says, well, we've got a budget of about, uh, let's say, yeah, you have like two million, then, two million spend, j spend, then spend one today and leave. Then you <laughs> leave voluntarily the will submit that, could you please spend half of it? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I know it's hard, but uh, again, we, we do have some responsibility as professionals. Thank you. And now uh, time for peak applause.